Hello and welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Jordan Lloyd and Colourgraph. I'm Artemis Irvin, and in today's episode, we're travelling back to 480 BCE to witness the Battle of Thermopylae. Even in its own time, the ancient Greek city-state of Sparta was famous for its military prowess and notorious for the harsh discipline of its authoritarian society. In today's episode, we witness the Spartans at their bloody and fearless best and watch the unfolding of one of the most famous battles in history, when King Leonidas gathered together 300 of his elite Spartan soldiers to face the vast hordes of the invading Persian army at the Battle of Thermopylae. Our guide on this journey is the ancient historian and classicist, Professor Paul Cartledge. Professor Cartledge is the Senior Research Fellow of Clare College and the Emeritus A.G. Leventis Professor of Greek Culture at the University of Cambridge. He is an honorary citizen of modern Sparta and holds the Gold Cross of the Order of Honour awarded by the President of the Hellenic Republic. He is also President of the UK Society for the Promotion of Hellenic Studies. His new book, Thebes, The Forgotten City of Ancient Greece, is out on November 12th and has already been described by Bethany Hughes as an incisive, inspiring and vitally illuminating account of a city which changed the ancient world. Violet spoke to Professor Cartledge just the other day. I'd like to start by welcoming you onto the podcast, Paul. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on. Hello, and thank you, Violet, very much for inviting me on. So you you wrote a book about Thermopylae many years ago, but um, I know that um, you have published this year another book about uh, the Thebans. So can you just tell us briefly about, about that book, why you were moved to write about Thebes? What I want to do was rescue from um, condescension or obloquy um, the positives uh, that the Thebans contributed to Greek civilization as a whole. I was trying to argue that though they, uh, the Theban city is often forgotten, and that's why my subtitle is The Forgotten City of Ancient Greece, nevertheless, they developed their own epic a mythology in verse. They had their own mythical patois, famously a man called Cadmos who founded the city, Oedipus, the king of Thebes, who didn't realise that he was the son of the man that he killed at a crossroads and that he was actually himself a Theban. He thought he was a Corinthian. This is the famous story of the riddle of the Sphinx, which he brilliantly solves, becomes king of Thebes because he solves a plague, marries, oh dear, his mother, and has (laughs) four children with her, so commits incest, absolute horrors. His children are also his uh, half-siblings. And so, well, we know Theban mythology, not from the originals, which the Greeks decided not to preserve for some reason, thousands of lines of epic verse, but through the versions of the myths told in the Athenian dramas of Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and others, the famous Antigone play, Oedipus Tyrannus, the seven against Thebes. So Thebes mythically has a key role in the enhancement of this notion of the Greeks as brilliant storytellers um, on the most horrible themes. But I'm also interested in Thebes, the city of history. And Thebes produced in the fourth century, so we're coming down a century later, an amazing set of people who led Thebes to becoming the most important, temporarily, very briefly, city in all mainland Greece. And whereas typically Greek cities were individualistic, they weren't keen on spreading their citizenship, Thebes was a federal capital, and it was itself organized federally, and it spread federalism. Some people think federalism is a good thing. I'm one of them. I'm not wildly keen on the nation state today. (laughs) And can you tell us which year you're going to take us back to today, please? 
I'm going to take you back to 480, 480 BC, before Christ, or as more and more of us now, I think, say, ancient historians, ancient historians of Greece and Rome, BCE, 480 BC or BCE, before the Common Era. Okay, so we're going very far back in time. Can you set the scene for us a bit? Because um, I know we're going back to um, a very famous battle, and can you just explain a bit about the Greek world at that time and the Persian Empire and how the two interacted? Yes, we're going back to, as you say, the Greek world. It's very important to remember that when we say ancient Greece, it's not like ancient Greece. is not like today's Greece, which is a, a nation state. The Greek world extended vastly as far um, west as what's today southern France, North Africa, and as far east as what's today Georgia, the far eastern end of the Black Sea. Greeks had been emigrating and permanently settling all around the Mediterranean, all around the Black Sea since about 700 BC, BCE. So we're 200 years down the line from 700. We're at the beginning of the 5th century BC. The world, that is the geopolitical world of the Aegean, is divided between two culture blocks, one of which is a more or less unified political empire, the other which is very, very diverse. So to the east, the fastest growing oriental empire to date, the Persian Empire, because it's based in southern Iran, in Persis, as the Greeks call it, Parsa, as the Persians called it. And one man, Cyrus, Cyrus the Great, Kurash in Persian, is credited with being the founder of that empire. And he was from a family which is called the Achaemenids, descendants of Achaemenes in Greek. So it's the Achaemenid Persian Empire extended all the way far west as um, the Aegean and as far east as what's today Pakistan, Kashmir, northwest India, that sort of area. And at the very far west, the Persian Empire, which had expanded from the middle of the sixth century, included now therefore many Greek cities, some of which had quite close connections with their, as it were, cousins, indeed people they thought had founded them further to the west. For example, Athens was thought to be one of the founders of a number of these cities in the Persian Empire in Asia. Clashes arose, and the historian of these clashes is Herodotus, who actually came from, he was born within the Persian Empire, a place called Halicarnassus, modern Bodrum in what's now Turkey. And he saw that this was a massive conflict of major, as it were, global earth-shattering proportions in terms of both culture and politics. So he was a Greek and he spoke only Greek. He couldn't um, understand Persian or read Persian. Persian or Aramaic. So, of course, he's dependent on the sources who uh, can inform him in his language, either native Greeks who have Persian experience or Persians or other Orientals who speak Greek. Well, he wrote an account. It's the world's first, that is the Western world's first work of history, properly so called, about why Greeks and non Greeks, meaning Persians, fought each other. Well, it started off with having conquered the Greeks of the Western Asiatic seaboard, a number of them got, after about um, half a century or so, fed up with being in the Persian Empire, and they wanted out. And about 500 BC, there was a great revolt. The, the causes are complex, the um, way in which it unrolled complex. I won't go into that. But it culminated in a great defeat for the rebellious Greeks of Asia. Unfortunately, or depending on how you look at it, fortunately, those rebellious Greeks had been supported by two of their, as it were, cousinly cities on uh, the Greek mainland. And the most important of those was Athens. So after defeating, putting down the rebellion, it took them six years to put it down. So it was a major rebellion. Persians had on their agenda punishment. We don't want any further interference in our empire 
from outside to the West from pesky Greeks like the Athenians. So we're going to teach the Athenians a lesson. And great King Emperor Darius I sends a large land and sea-based, mainly sea-based expedition against the Athenians. And that culminates in, for them, a major defeat, the Battle of Marathon. So Marathon um, merely racks up uh, the sort of deficit, the debit that um, the Persians think of the Greeks as having incurred, the mainland Greeks. So Darius dies 486 BC, BCE. His son, Xerxes, takes over as emperor. This is a Greek spelling of a Persian name, something like Shyathra. Xerxes gets together the biggest amphibious uh, expedition known to man in Europe um, before June the 6th, 1944, in other words, D-Day. So it's a massive, we, we can't be sure exactly how many. Greeks in the 480s know that this expedition is on its way. And since it's pretty clear that it's no longer going to be just an attack on Athens, to put Athens in its place, but it's going to be an expedition of conquest involving not only Athens, but other Greek cities of the mainland. The most important of those, apart from Athens, Sparta has to make a decision. Is it going to resist or are they, the Greeks, going to, as it were, roll over and let the Persians take over? Well, the Spartans decide to resist. And that's where my story, my battle of Thermopylae in the first year of the Persian amphibious invasion in 480 is situated. Okay, and how were these Greek, because as, as you say, they, they were all separate city-states. The, 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 there was no kind of Greek, um, you know, no Greece as as there is nowadays. Um, as we, uh, there was no sort of nation. How were these um, city states connected? What what was it that made them feel? Was it language? Was it culture? Was it a combination? Because I know they fought amongst themselves a lot as well. Especially Athens and Sparta were were big um, competitors, weren't they? Completely right. Well, Herodotus, our main source, is particularly helpful on this because he himself, being neither an Athenian nor a Spartan, looking in, as it were, from the outside, but yet a beneficiary from the result of the Greek-Persian wars, um, he has a particular interest in this, and he actually uh, has a, a wonderful speech. He writes it, of course, puts it in the mouth of the Athenians, who for him are the more heroic of the two resistors, the two main ones, Sparta and Athens, to the effect that being Greek, what it is to be Greek is not a matter of politics. It's a matter of uh, language, of alleged common, I mean, what you and I would call DNA connection. So literal physical descent from the same human ancestors. There's a certain amount of um, myth going on here. And thirdly, and for the Greeks, uh, in a way most important, uh, religion. So they worship the same gods, goddesses, heroes and heroines. They are, of course, polytheists in the same sorts of ways, in the same places. And the one area where Greeks got together regularly, all Greeks from the expanded Hellenic world, regularly was at pan-Hellenic all Greek religious festivals, of which the, there are four that are the most important, but for our purposes, the Olympic Games every four years and the Games at Delphi uh, every four years, and then every two years, Games at Corinth and Games at Nemea in the Peloponnese. Well, it was at the Isthmus, the Isthmian Sanctuary of Poseidon, that a tiny handful of mainland Greeks um, racked up the courage to resist this massive uh, impending Persian uh, invasion. So in 481 BC, the year before the invasion actually happened, a number of delegates from only 30 plus, you know, very, very few out of the possibly 700 separate Greek polities in the Aegean area, only 30 plus, 31, 32, 33, swore an oath 
in the sanctuary of Poseidon at the Isthmus, Poseidon being god of the sea, god of earthquakes, that they would resist, come what may, by military might, so far as they could possess any might, by land and by sea. And then as the invasion got more and more close, impending, it actually started in spring of 480, there was a division of labour. Sparta is to be the overall leader because it's got the most allies from among the 30 plus. It is the uh, leader of an alliance which included more than half of those. Sparta, however, is a land power. So it will have the dominant role on land. Athens, very recently, but Athens was by 481, 480, a naval power. So it will take the lead in strategy and tactics in any naval encounters. Okay, so they divided it up, but um, democracy had, had begun, the, had, it, has had, had had its beginnings, hadn't it already? And do you think that played into the Greeks' desire to not be under uh, the, the will of a tyrant? Yes and no. In other words, the Spartans were never Democrats. They didn't support the form of democracy the Athenians developed. They, in fact, opposed it within Greece. So they weren't fighting for democracy. They had loads and loads of, well, they're called helots, which means captives. They're Greek kind of serfs as their major workforce. So they're not um, wildly democratic in their outlook on life. What they were keen on was freedom from. Independence and freedom, of course, always has two sides, freedom yeah. to, freedom from. And so they all agreed that what they were fighting for was freedom. But for the Spartans and for the Athenians, a different kind of freedom. But in both cases, freedom from Persian imposition, from being subject to a non-Greek power, which is what actually had generated the revolt I mentioned of the Greeks in the Persian Empire 20 years before. OK, wonderful. Well, that's, I think that's a really good introduction. So now we kind of know where we are. So should we go to your first scene, which I believe is in Sparta? which is a quite an extraordinary civilization. They had very much their own way of doing things. So can you take us to Sparta and tell us what we're witnessing, please? Sparta was a cosmos, and cosmos means originally something ordered, and it means a totality that has an inner organising structure and a, a totality uh, of congruence in political, social, economic, etc. terms. Modern scholars, influenced by the Soviet Union back in the 30s, 40s, even spoke of Sparta as a totalitarian state. Others said, hang on, yes, they were military, yes, it was very much um, uh, communal, collective, not individual, but actually they weren't totalitarian, there was no inner party, as it were, which um, had a police state, um, but nevertheless it was authoritarian. So this radical disjuncture between Sparta and Athens, and what we know about Sparta too often, unfortunately, <coughs> comes from Athenian sources who are either very hostile, gosh, thank goodness we're not like them, or very favourable, if only we were a bit more like them, because it's quite nice being a master race isn't it? <laughs> so the Spartans um, were definitely top dog in terms of their military competence in land warfare, but they preserved a very odd sort, I mean they developed, preserved a very odd sort of political constitution. It was rather like an arrested development, whereas other states evolved, and of course Athens evolved into democracy, uh, the Spartans sort of rigidified and froze their constitution at an earlier stage of political development, such that even as late as 480 BC, they not only had one king, they had two kings. And these kings, though they're not obviously monarchs, they're dyars 
had certain sort of inherited privileges. They're charismatic rulers. They're aristocrats of an extreme kind, and they can do certain things through patronage that no one, and so on and so on. They have an automatic seat in the inner, well, we call it a senate, so using a Latin word. The Greek word is gerousia. It was a council of elders, 28 of them chosen, elected for life. It's like the American Supreme Court in that respect two of them ex officio the two kings who came hereditarily from two families so Leonidas in 480 is one of the two kings and he is the more dominant because he's the one the sources make it absolutely clear he's taking the lead he thinks Sparta must lead Greece in resistance against the Persians and he's going to have a say in how the Spartans exercise their leadership by land and do we have any idea what the city would have looked like at, at, at this stage of its history? We do. It, again, this is where the Athens contrast comes in. And the, the main source here, it's a rather nice remark of Thucydides, who was Herodotus's successor as a major historian of Greek affairs. He says that if someone in the future were to go to Athens, and Athens would be in ruins, of course, over time, and look at the ruins, he or she would say, wow, what a city. And Thucydides adds, that person would overestimate how powerful Athens had once been. It's a very remarkable thing, because if you go today, you're going to exactly look at ruins. Yeah. And you probably are going to make that mistake. He said, if on the other hand, in the future, a traveller were to go to Sparta, they would be conversely astonished that a place that was so unbuilt up, so much more like a set of villages, without major temples and other public structures, built structures, they would go the other way and get it wrong. They would underestimate just how powerful the Spartans had once been. So physically, Sparta nestles in a valley between two major mountain chains. It's about 150 miles from Athens to the south, 250 kilometers. It's very well protected on the north by hills, which make it actually quite difficult to attack Sparta directly from the north. On the west, it has the huge mountain range, Taygetus, on the east, Parnon, and then it's about 25 miles from the sea. So if you're going to launch a, a naval attack on Sparta, you land, but then you've still got 25 miles to go. So the Spartans have got a lot of time to prepare to meet you and long way from their city. And so it was, I think, three to 400 years before an enemy penetrated the city of Sparta or the town, uh, the capital of Sparta, and which happened only in the fourth century, about a hundred years after the Battle of Thermopylae in 480. Wow, and so here we are in this extremely well-protected collection of villages, and um, what is happening at this precise moment? Right, now the next factor to add in is the educational system. Sparta uniquely in all Greece had a centralized compulsory education system for both boys and girls, separate but both, different but for both sexes, which was in itself extraordinary. And from the age of seven upwards, a boy was taken away from his parents' home and more or less spent all his time in public, in the center, in a barracks, as it were. And one way in which um, the Spartans distinguished themselves was that they made the attainment of citizenship dependent on passing through this military, militarized educational regime. If when it came to the crunch, aged 18 to 20, you were up for election to one of what we call the messes, as it were, the common barracks of the adults. You, everybody, to become a Spartan citizen, you have to be elected to join a particular dining group. Well, suppose you were rejected at that point, boy, that was tough. 
So the very notion of being a citizen privileges, emphasizes military um, success and prowess, and then also comradeship, sort of small group bonding within the totality, the cosmos uh, that I mentioned earlier. So the crack of the youngest cohort, which is from 20 to 29, the crack element within that was the royal bodyguard of 300 and these are selected by the oldest of the cohort the 29 year olds choose the incoming members of the group we don't know of course how many would graduate in any one year but the point of it is this that this was an elite force 300 now, those of you who are at all familiar with the Thermopylae story will know that at uh, Thermopylae, the hot gates in northern Greece, Leonidas took with him a band of 300. However, and this is really the NARP, Herodotus, very good source, he actually visited Sparta, he talked to Spartans, he knew that this 300 was not the 300 royal bodyguard. Some of them might have been, but a specially selected force, which apart from being brave and therefore you know, elite uh, in terms of warrior qualities, had also to be married and to have already produced with their wife a son. Well, that's very interesting, isn't it? Because it suggests that there's a sense in which this group of 300 is not possibly going to survive. I mean, we argue, we ancient historians, whether it was deliberate. In other words, uh, it's expected that none of them will survive, or it's expected that um, many of them will not survive, and therefore it's very important to have sons who are going to carry on the family line, and of course to be patriotically passionate, to avenge their father's deaths and to live up to their father's heroic self-sacrifice. And did Leonidas personally choose the... the this? According to Herodotus, yes. And this makes sense to me because there's one other, it's a religious dimension which involves specifically Leonidas. A, an oracle was um, bruited abroad after the um, encounter. And it was said to come from Delphi, from Apollo. This is his main oracular shrine where a priestess chanted what she claimed were inspired words, inspired by Apollo directly, and then an oracle would be produced. And this oracle said, either um, Greece will be destroyed um, by the Persians as they're coming down, or if Sparta sacrifices a king, it may not be destroyed. Leonidas was very keen on this oracle. I'm that king. I'm going to sacrifice myself, not just for Sparta, but for all Greece. And so religion, what I was saying about all Greeks, Pan-Hellenic gathering at Delphi, this is a, um, an earnest of I think very peculiarly Leonidas's take on how crucial it was that the Spartans take the lead in resisting the Persian invasion. Hi, I'm Violet Moller. As you probably know, at Travels Through Time, we are lucky to work in partnership with the visual historian Jordan Lloyd. Jordan takes original black and white photographs and intricately colours them based on meticulous research. The resulting images are really breathtakingly beautiful and there is something magical about them. Jordan has produced several images specially to go with various episodes of Travels Through Time. Oscar Wilde lounging in scarlet stockings on a richly textured sofa. The gleaming turquoise domes of the US Capitol building. And the mesmerising details on the armour of the Japanese warrior are some of my personal favourites. To see these and many more besides, have a look at Jordan's website, colorgraph.co, where you can buy copies of these stunning prints. They make lovely and unusual presents for your loved ones or yourself. Travels Through Time listeners get 10% off any of their orders there. Just enter the code TTT at the checkout. Wow, so he's 
cho- chosen this 300 and um, basically resigned himself to the fact that he is not going to be returning either. And then they set off for Thermopylae. Um, and that will take us to your next scene, scene two. So can you, first of all, describe, because the, the topography of Thermopylae is, is very important, isn't it, to the story? Can you explain it? I hope there'll be a nice um, map or a diagram on the website on your episode page to illustrate it. It's not only, of course, where it is um, or how it's configured, but it's also where it is in Greece. Greeks had to decide, basically, by this time. We're in the summer of um, 480. In fact, a lot of them have had to decide earlier, but from the spring, when the expedition was launched across the Hellespont by land, by sea, uh, Leonidas uh, is back in Sparta, but Xerxes is leading by example in person. He's got a fleet of perhaps as many as 1,200 ships. Some people think fewer. He's got an army of perhaps 200,000 on land. Some think uh, fewer, 100,000 or so. The Greeks, Herodotus thought way more, but they got it completely wrong. Greeks in the north are going to be threatened most immediately. They therefore first have to decide sign up with the 30 plus who've sworn to resist, who are mainly from South Greece, or go over to the Persians, say, come on in guys, or try to strike a neutral pose. We're not uh, for you, but we're not against you. So be nice to us when you roll us over. Well, there was one city in central Greece, Thebes, which is near to Athens. So it's more Southern than Northern. And it had the nastiest choice of all, um, whether or not to go over to the Persians to stay with the loyalist groups or to try to strike a neutral pose. And it went over to the Persians. Well, that is south of Thermopylae. So though it went over to the Persians, it did not stop Leonidas and his 300 together with people from, including incidentally, um, places quite close to Thebes that were taking the opposite view. They're joining Leonidas in fighting against the Persians. Leonidas marches north. He's met by mainly local people. He doesn't take any Athenians with him, but altogether he has a force in the pass of about six to 7,000 Greek resistors. In the middle of the pass, there is what's called the middle gate. The pass runs east-west for about a kilometre. It's called Hot Gates. Hot because of sulphur springs. You can still bathe there if you want. Gates because, as this is the main way for anybody, any army coming from Thessaly to the north through Thermopylae in focus down into central Greece. There had been local defences already erected. So when Leonidas gets there, he refurbishes the defences. Xerxes pitches up with his, what, 80 plus thousand men at the western end of this pass. Leonidas is in the middle. And that is the scene set for three to four days. Xerxes waits, expecting Leonidas and his um, six to seven thousand, including his 300 elite Spartans, expecting them to give in. You know, it's so obvious that the overwhelming force, it's bound to be a Persian victory in time. It's just a matter of time. So why not give up now? Well, So far from that being the case, of course, the resistance is fierce. And when it starts, um, Herodotus is our main source here. He tells us how the Persians um, threaten the um, Greeks. They they use a lot of archers. There's a very different mode of fighting among the Persians from the mode among the Greeks. Greeks 
had archers, but they were very, very secondary. Their primary sort of fighter was a heavy armed infantry fighter who would fight hand to hand in a massed phalanx. Well, in the pass, which was wide enough in places only for a couple of chariots to pass, and it's very near the sea, uh, the topography's changed today. You think, oh gosh, the sea is a kilometer away to the north. Well, it is now, but it wasn't then. It was right next to the pass. And so there is initially, of course, a kind of mismatch between the two forces. But where the Spartans and the, their allies actually do engage with uh, the Persians, they, they come off very much better. And even the elite um, median, that's northern Iranian forces, and then the Persian immortals, they're called immortals by the Greeks, because it was thought that once one of the 10,000 was killed, these are the royal bodyguard, then they were immediately replaced. Well, actually, the Persians called them something different. And for the first day, actually, the Persian Xerxes comes off distinctly worse. That's interesting. And do you think the two, I mean, presumably they wouldn't have been able to see each other or they wouldn't have been able to see the extent? It's not like a, a, you know, a normal battle where it's usually on an enormous plane and one side is quite aware of the size of the other side. Presumably that wasn't the case here. If they're in a very narrow sort of tunnel or pass. You know, exactly right. And um, that remains the case, of course, throughout. And Spartans were famous, um, among other things, for being laconic. Um, laconic comes from another word for, for Spartan, and it means clipped, terse, military uh, discourse. And one Spartan was on record. It's a bit of a puzzle how <laughs> the evidence actually survived. But he was told, you know, the Persians, they've got so many archers that they're going to blot out the sun. And this is in August, and it's going to get up to 40. Degrees. So this Spartan, actually a very famous one, he's called the Enekes, replies, Great, we'll have the battle in the shade. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's what's called the Spartan Apop them. Well, after the first day setback for um, Xerxes, Leonidas has prepared for the eventuality that someone local who knows the terrain might reveal to Xerxes that there is actually a way round the back, going from the south, and you can then come back down the mountain into the pass at the eastern end. He, Leonidas, sends a local force of Phokian soldiers to guard that pass. And even if they're unable to prevent what can only be a relatively small number of Persians, because the pass behind is quite narrow and steep. Even if they can't prevent them getting down into the pass, at least they'll, Leonidas will be forewarned by this outpost that this is likely to happen, and he therefore can make a decision about what best to do. Well, the story that won most credence, uh, especially with Herodotus and especially with the Spartans, but there are alternative views, is that a local man, not actually a Phokian, which is where Thermopylae is, but from the neighboring people of Marlis, a guy called uh, Ephialtes, on the second day, goes to Xerxes, saying, Xerxes, I've got some information. He wants money. He's, doing, he's being a traitor to Greece for the sake of personal financial gain. And he tells Xerxes about this back pass, which Xerxes acts upon. Now, is it necessarily the case that Xerxes needed such a traitor at such a moment? Well, it might be just too good. You know, the story might be too good to be true. But at any rate, the Spartans believed the story. And after all the fighting's over, you know, a couple of years later, they sent out a hit squad to murder. Uh, Ephialtes. And the word Ephialtes in modern Greek is the word for nightmare. So if you have a nightmare, you have an Ephialtes. <laughs> That's funny. I can't believe that they waited two years and then sent 
Well, they waited because the planting went on for two years. You see, 480 summer, you've got Thermopylae followed by Sanlis, and then there's a winter, and then the thing all starts again, kicks off again the following summer, 479, Plataea on land, Mikali at sea. So it's not until 478, really, that the Spartans can think it's all over. You know, the Persians yeah. are, yeah. Um, okay, so we, we need to go back to the battle which is still raging um and this is your third scene um and i believe that it's actually the morning of the final day of the battle and leonidas is sort of getting you know trying to inspire what's left of his um army for the last do or die big push what's left is exactly the right way to put it because Whereas he might have started off with six to 7,000 troops, by day three, he's down to oh, a few hundred. And the reason for that is twofold. One, a number of those who'd signed up and sent troops in 480 before the battle saw that they were about to be killed if they didn't leave. And the official propaganda of Sparta after the battle is that Leonidas said to them, you may leave if you wish. In other words, they would not be tarnished with the reputation of runaways and cowards. I suspect that quite a lot of them actually did just run, which makes all the more significant the ones who were still there waiting, pincered in the pass, because on the West End, you've got the main troop body of Xerxes, at the east now, having come round by the pass, you have a smaller, but they are nevertheless big enough to kettle the remaining uh, Greek resistors. Leonidas and however many of the 300 still uh, survived, plus people from the city of Thespiae, which is near Thebes, it's a Boeotian, that's the region, Boeotian city, which was out of sympathy with Thebes, because Thebes had gone over to the Persians, their fellow Boeotians were, in the eyes of the Thespians, traitors. And then there were, interestingly, a number from Thebes. And there's a big dispute about um, these uh, few hundred uh, Thebans. Were they there as volunteers? In other words, their city had gone over to Persia, but they themselves were loyal Greek resistors, so they volunteered to join. Or, now this is interesting, um, the Spartan official line, because they were very hostile to Thebes, because Thebes as a city had gone over to the Persians. After the battle and after the war was over, they, of course, were nasty to Thebes. And they said, no, no, those Thebans who joined us, they weren't volunteers, they weren't wonderful people. They were hostages so that the Thebans would not do anything actually on behalf of the Persians in our rear. And then they would be, those hostages would be killed. Anyway, um, it's come down to a final moment at which a number have been captured by the Persians. Leonidas and his Spartans retreat to a small hill. It's the hill now where there is a, a famous um, inscription from a, a famous epigram. It says something like, go tell the Spartan stranger passing by that here, obedient to the laws of the Spartans, we lie. It was attributed to Simonides, a praise poet from the island of Chaos, or uh, K -A, as it is today. And the Spartans with Leonidas, they do die. And um, Leonidas' corpse is um, mutilated. There is um, terrific gloating, as um, Herodotus describes the Persians who are all invited. And in fact, the fleet of the Persians was not that far away because land and army and fleet um, operate in sync so far as they can, partly for communications, partly for supply purposes. So uh, Xerxes summons people from the fleet, land, come up to Thermopylae, have a good gloat over the corpses of my enemy. And Herodotus says, but then, of course, he might be biased, and that Xerxes does his best to minimise the actually very large number of Persian, I mean, I mean, people on the Persian side, uh, dead, 
um, possibly as many as 20,000 on the Persian side, which is three times the number of Leonidas's force just straight away. So Thermopylae, though it's a defeat, and it's a major defeat, it was uh, a glorious defeat. And it's gone down in history, of course, as one of those great last stands, along with, for example, the Alamo in the States, in Texas. And do you think that's why it has endured in the way that it has? I mean, because, you know, it, it, is a, it is very, very famous, isn't it? There's been at least two films made about it, the most recent one in 2007. And yet, as you say, it was a defeat. So why do you think it has endured so strongly in people's imagination? It, I mean, what, do you think it has something to do with the fact that Herodotus wrote in such detail about it? What, why do you think it is? It goes back originally to the propaganda war between Athens and Sparta after the victory overall in the uh, five altogether major encounters, 480, 479. You know, who was it Sparta? Was it Athens? Was most responsible for saving Greece, Hellas, from Persian domination. Herodotus went with Athens and said that because of the victory on uh, sea at Salamis that followed a few weeks after um, Thermopylae, it was the Athenians who were the saviors. Of, well, of course, the Spartans wouldn't um, tolerate that. And what they emphasized was the numbers, the amount of commitment that those um, 300 plus Leonidas represented. Herodotus, however, interestingly, records, and I'm sure he's right about he says, I know the names of all the 300, but two of them actually, for different reasons, didn't fight to the death. They actually weren't there for different reasons on the last day. And so um, it, the story is not quite as neat. And a lot of people get it wrong. They say all 300 died together with Leonidas. Well, actually, 298 of them died plus Leonidas. However, the important thing was no surrender. And this, of course, no pasaran. This is the Spanish uh, motto as well. The Spartans emphasized that um, they would never give in. And when actually they did later occasionally have to give in, the Greek world in general, we're told, is astonished. That, that can't be true. You, you mean a Spartan force surrendered? And so on. So no surrender becomes associated as part of a Spartan myth. Now, why was, the, why was this battle, though a defeat, recorded and remembered very often as if it's a kind of victory? Well, I think Montaigne put it very well in his essays in 1580. He said that it's one of those morale victories that, though it's actually a defeat, because the Persians pour through Thermopylae after the battle, and they attack Athens, they sack Athens, they burn the Acropolis. Terrible. They occupy. By Athens. Nevertheless, because of the, the sort of example the Spartans set, somebody had to take the Persians on first, and the Spartans did that. They led from the front, and that, I think, probably is what explains the very often misunderstood um, reception in the more recent times since the 16th century of this battle. It's a sort of glorification of bravery, basically. And is it not correct that it is the 2,500 year anniversary? This Is it this year? <laughs> if my math serves me right. It does not, and I'll tell you why. It's a, an awful thing to have to say. Is it next year? It is. There is yeah. an official <clears throat> committee, I'm a member of it, which is to celebrate, commemorate Thermopylae together with Salamis on the basis that this is the 2500th anniversary. However, there was no BC or AD naught. So you go from 480 oh. to, one, to 1 BC, which is 479, and then you add on whatever the AD date is. And of course, 2021 one, of course. 9 equals to but there's another reason why the Greeks are keen on celebrating this year, 
And that's because next year is the bicentenary of the rising against the Ottoman Turks. And so they want to keep that clear for absolutely mega, mega. But on their own basis, they will have to celebrate next year as the 2500th anniversary of the decisive land battle, Plataea, and uh, the final naval battle, which is uh, Mikali. Okay, but we can celebrate the, the almost 2500th anniversary with this podcast i hope we can but i want to before we leave it um add that there are two more spartan apple themes which have a continuing resonance and one of them more particularly reflects the fact that sparta today is not just a neutral thing but that people in the house of commons call themselves spartans people in america in the marines of the u.s marines think of themselves as spartans well the nicer of the two epithems is leonidas on the morning of the third day says to his men eat a hearty breakfast men because tonight we'll be dining in Hades. Well, actually, there's not a lot of food in Hades. And the Greeks did not think of corpses after death in the way the Egyptians did, as mummified, coming back to life and having a normal human existence in the afterlife. So that's a joke. It's gallows humour. The other one is not a joke. Xerxes, early on in the face-off, is said to have said, this is a much later source, this is later than Herodotus, he ordered Leonidas to surrender. And he said, put down your arms and surrender. And Leonidas is said to have returned that uh, demand with a two-word, a laconic message, molon labe. And in Greek, that has a terrific resonance. It's in the second person singular, the, um, as it were, personal mode, not the formal second person plural mode that one king would normally use to another. So it's insulting. And it means come, we have to say it in English in four words, come and get them, molon labe. Look on the website today for that phrase and you'll find it associated with American gun clubs members of which very often are committed to a particular interpretation of the Second Amendment of the US Constitution. So it goes with the gun lobby in the States and just shows how some ancient history is still very much, uh, sadly in this case, I think modern history. Yes, and I think that takes me to the last question that I have to ask, which is if you could have um, picked up an object from one of these scenes and popped it in your pocket, brought it back to the present with you, what would it be? Yes, it would be one of those weapons. And actually you can do that because the mound I mentioned, little mound on which the Spartans made their last stand was excavated just before the Second World War by the then um, director of antiquities, in general, in Athens. And he found under the mound, as one would have predicted, a lot of Persian oriental type arrowheads, some of which are now in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, some of which are in a museum which is near to the site of the battle at a place called Lamia in Thessaly. And so uh, I'd love to have one, (laughs) one of those because it represents just one arrowhead. It picks up on that um, bon mot of Dienikes. It represents the difference between Oriental mode of fighting and Greek mode. And it would have come from this symbolically significant spot where now there is that inscription about telling the Spartans uh, to, that, that they, those who die, died heroically obeying orders. That would be a nice thing to have on your desk to remind you of the heroism of the battle. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Um, Thank you for taking us so far back into the ancient world and for telling us about that incredible battle. Thank you very much, Paul. Entirely my pleasure, Violet. Thank you for inviting me.
That was Violet Moller talking to Professor Paul Cartledge about the year 480 BCE and one of the most significant wars in ancient Greek history. His book, Thebes, The Forgotten City of Ancient Greece, is out on November 12th and is published by Picador. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>